Well, happy new, happy new Year to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining with us. We trust that you got some sleep uh, between last night and today. But can I thank you once again for having me along to join with you for this special time. It has been my pleasure to come and fellowship with you and to minister the Word of God. It has been a blessing to my soul. I thank God for the ministry of the Word to me, and I thank you for your warm fellowship as well. If you're wondering why I'm taking pictures, my children love to see where I go and uh, the people that I meet, and also the food that I eat as well. <laughs> So um, I have been able to take many pictures of your, your lovely food, and my children are delighted um, uh, to see where Daddy has been uh, these past couple of days. We're turning this morning, or this afternoon as it is now, to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. And my text is found, well, we will read from verse 35. I had another message that I was minded to preach today, but when I woke up this morning, um, I was uneasy with that message, and the Lord guided me to this passage, and I trust that in the Lord's divine providence, he has done that for uh, a reason, perhaps for me, perhaps for you, or perhaps for all of us here today. Genesis 42, reading from verse 35, this is whenever the sons of Jacob returned to their father after having been into Egypt and met Joseph. <clears throat> it came to pass as they emptied their sacks that behold, Every man's bundle of money was in his sack, and when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children? Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. It's those words of verse 36. Whenever Jacob says, all these things are against me, that I want us to think about here today. Let us unite together in prayer now as we come to God's word. Almighty and ever-blessed God, we thank thee that we can begin this new year in thy presence, worshiping thee, and being like Mary, sitting at thy feet, desiring to hear thy voice. Lord, thou knowest the tiredness that can be upon our bodies. Thou knowest the busyness of these past few days. But we ask thee now that as we come and sit before thee, that thou would break the bread of life, that thou would feed us on the living word of the living God. So come and make this a time of blessing, a time of refreshing, a time, Father, when we hear thee speaking. Come and pardon our sin and give help to preacher and hearer alike, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Jacob lived something of a roller coaster life. Jacob was always up to something. His life was full of activity. If you contrast the life of Jacob with that of his father, you will see that Jacob got up to um, many more things than his father did. Isaac lived, well, Scripture doesn't record much of the upbringing of Isaac. He seemed to have lived quite a, a plain life in many ways. But Jacob was very different. Even in his mother's womb, Jacob had to be involved in some sort of activity. The Bible records how Jacob and Esau wrestled together in their mother's womb. As Jacob was growing up, he stole his brother's birthright from him. He exchanged, well, he exchanged it uh, for some pottage. 
he also deceived his father into giving him the blessing that was due for Esau. He tricked his father Isaac. The end result was that his brother Esau was looking to kill him. So even in his early formative years, Jacob lived something of a roller coaster life. He had to flee from his brother Esau. He had to leave the family home. His mother sent him to go and live with his uncle Laban in Padanaram. Uh, life in Padanaram was full of um, um, twists and turns as well. His uncle tricked him in giving him the wrong wife. He ended up with um, Rachel when he was uh, in expected to get Rebecca. So the one who tricked his brother ended up being tricked by his uncle. Jacob ended up taking too many wives. Um, why a man would want more than one wife, I don't know. But uh, he ended up taking uh, four uh, wives effectively, and that caused trouble within the home. His daughter Dina ended up being defiled by a Hivite, and his son sought retribution upon the Hivites, and that they uh, slaughtered the Hivites in retaliation. So Jacob had uh, quite an interesting life up to this stage that would make uh, for a prolonged movie or a TV series in today's society. But Jacob had a special relationship with God. I don't believe Jacob was converted until he left the family home. As Jacob traveled to Badanaram, he came to Bethel. He laid his head down on that stone. He saw the vision of the angels ascending and descending from heaven. And as he opened his eyes, he said, this is an awful place. And truly, for the new convert, they open their eyes and they look at the world and they say, this is an awful place. The ungodly love the world because this world is a heaven to them. But for the Christian, we look out those doors and we say, this is an awful place. I believe Jacob was converted on that day. He went to Padanaram as a converted man. But whenever he left Padanaram 20 years later and he returned, he wrestled with God in Peniel. And as he wrestled with the Lord Jesus Christ there, the Lord touched his heart and he touched his thigh. And Jacob never walked the same again. God gave him a new name. He was no longer Jacob. He had the name of Israel which means prince with God. And certainly Jacob was a prince with God. Although Jacob was a man who had many weaknesses, many faults, many failures, many shortcomings, he experienced the transforming power of God in his life. And can I say the Christian is still one who has many weaknesses. The Christian is still one who makes many mistakes and has many failures. But above everything, the Christian is one who has experienced the new birth. They have experienced the regenerating power of the Holy Ghost within their lives. They have had their eyes open to see the awfulness of sin and the loveliness of Christ. We're not perfect in this life. We're being perfected. But it is a slow prog uh, process. So we come to a time in Genesis 42, in Jacob's life, when he is struggling to take in everything that is happening around him. The Bible does not paint a rosy picture of the Christian life. The Bible doesn't say that whenever we become Christians, everything will be wonderful and happy and there'll never be a cloud in the sky. Of course not. Nor does the Bible make all of God's children out to be perfect. The Bible paints the picture of men, warts and all. It shows us these men with the same failures that we have. Showing us, not, not painting the perfect example of the Christian, but showing that, that, that even Christians are weak as well. The Bible shows us what men really are. As we look at this verse, I believe that Jacob is struggling I believe that the events of life have caught up with him and he's struggling. He's struggling perhaps in his own faith, maybe struggling to comprehend why God is allowing all these things to happen to him. 
Think of the events that have happened in his life. His favorite son, Joseph, is missing and presumed dead. Well, Jacob thinks he's dead. His brothers brought back Joseph's coat of many colors, stained with blood. They've left their father to presume that Joseph is dead when really they sold him as a slave. Then a terrible famine has come to the land. So not only is Joseph gone, but famine has come, and Jacob, as the head of the home, is wondering, how am I going to feed my family? How am I going to provide for my family in this famine? Uh, money can't, can't cause food to suddenly spring up from the ground. So he's mindful of his loved ones. He sent his sons to Egypt to buy food not realizing they were buying it from Joseph. Whenever they return, Simeon has been left as a surety in the land of Egypt. And Joseph, the governor of Egypt, wants the sons of Jacob to return to him and bring Benjamin down to Egypt. And the sons of Jacob are now trying to persuade Jacob to let them take Benjamin with him to Egypt to get more food. And Jacob is fearful. He doesn't know what's happening in these circumstances. Joseph is presumed dead. Simeon is locked up in Egypt. A strange man who he doesn't know, but we know is Joseph, wants all of Jacob's sons to travel down to Egypt. Jacob is maybe thinking, this is a trap. If all my sons go down there, they could end up dead, and I will be left with no children, left with no posterity at all. Why is Jacob fearful? Well, Jacob is fearful because he hasn't yet realized that God is in control of all these matters. God protected Joseph from his evil brothers. He spared Joseph's life. God now has Joseph elevated to the position of prime minister in Egypt. God saw that Joseph was put in charge of the food supplies throughout the famine. God prepared someone to care for Jacob and his family in the time of famine. So Jacob looks out and he can only see famine. He doesn't realize that God has provided Joseph's or Jacob's son Joseph to be the overseer of the food in this time of famine. Jacob doesn't see what God is doing behind the scenes. A time of adversity has come upon Jacob. And all he can do is cry out in verse 36, all these things are against me. A missing son, a time of famine, a ruler in Egypt who wants his family to travel down there. Jacob is left in despair and he cries out, all these things are against me. Does this sound like a man who has the title Prince with God? No, it sounds like the words of somebody who's far from God, far from faith in God, far from trusting in God. Do these sound like the words of a Christian? Somebody who would say, all these things are against me, complaining about God's providence in their lives. Yet, friends, how often have these been our words? We might not stand up and say them outward publicly, but inwardly in our heart, whenever circumstances go against us in life, whenever we can't see what God is planning and what God is controlling, how often do we cry out like Jacob, all these things are against me. When things aren't going well in the home, how often do we say these things are against me? When things aren't going well in the workplace, when we seem to be suffering in the workplace, how often do we say these things are against me? Whenever we have some sickness or illness in our body, how often do we say these things are against me? When we seem to be walking through a thick cloud of darkness, and we can't see a single ray of light. How often do we say these things are against me? Is it really appropriate for a Christian 
to say these words, all these things are against me. Well, dear friend, as we enter in, as we have entered into this new year, I would like to take as the title of my message, Responding to Adversity. We can be sure that at some stage through this next year, trials will come upon us. I will face trials. You will face trials. They may be the same trials. They may be different trials. The truth is, it doesn't matter what the trial is. It matters how we respond to these trials. And how will we respond? Will we respond like Jacob and say, all these things are against me? Or will we respond differently? Let's look today at how to respond to adversity three headings to leave with you. First of all, remember, remember where your peace is found. And this is vitally important. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 and the verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, it says, of Christ and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Now, there may be times in our life when we maybe don't feel like we have peace, but dear friends, can I assure you that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us peace in the greatest problem that we have in life. And the problem that we have is that we're born in sin. We're separated from God. There is a big gulf between us and God. It is the canyon of our sin. It's as if God is one side of the mountain and we're on another mountain. And we're not able to bring ourselves back to God. But as the, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Colossae, that Christ has made peace. He has made peace between us and God. We have been reconciled to God. How? Through the blood of his cross. Not through our good works, not through our obedience, not through our efforts, but through Christ. So Christ is the one who gives us peace with God. He has dealt with our greatest and biggest problems, our problems of sin, and he has reconciled us. Dear friend, remember that your troubles and trials in this life are only temporary. They're only fleeting. They will be here for a little season. You won't have them for all eternity. But your biggest problem, your problem of sin, Christ has dealt with that. He has brought us peace with God. So the trials that we pass through in, in life, we're not going through them alone. We're doing so with Christ by our side. We're doing so with him leading and guiding, comforting us through this journey. So remember, your peace is found in salvation. We should never forget the salvation that Christ has given to us. As we meditate upon salvation, it makes all our problems seem small in comparison to what Christ has done for us. Also, if you turn with me to Psalm 115, verse 3, your peace is found not only in salvation, but in the sovereignty of God. If you're ever looking to do a study on the sovereignty of God, there's an Englishman by the name of Arthur W. Pink, and he has wrote a tremendous book called The Sovereignty of God. I would recommend it to you. You're getting a lot of book recommendations from me. The Christian bookshops will be uh, flooded uh, in the new year. But uh, A.W. Pink has a great book in The Sovereignty of God. Psalm 115 verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. You see, God will do what glorifies him. He will do what pleases him. He will labor for his glory. And he uses us to that end. God uses us as instruments, vessels for his glory. Now, sometimes we might not like the way that God directs us or uh, uh, in life, but he does it for his glory. So every time that God brings circumstances your way, remember that God is in control of those circumstances. He has ordered those circumstances in your life for his glory. 
And we are to be those who see that God is not sitting back, not in control. God is in control. Just as the chess player is in control of the chess pieces that he moves around the board. So God is in control of every event in my life and your life. So never think that God doesn't care. Never think that God has forgotten about you. Never cry out, all these things are against me, because God has brought those things in your life for a reason and for a purpose. We might not understand it. Jacob didn't understand why, why the governor of Egypt wanted his uh, other sons to come down. But after a, a, a while, he came to see that God had ordained that Joseph would be prime minister. God had a plan that Jacob just wasn't aware of. Also, we must submit to God's providence. Our peace is found in salvation. Our peace is found in the sovereignty of God. And our peace is found in submission. We can think of Eli. Eli had two wicked sons. Hophni and Phinehas. And God revealed to Samuel that he was going to kill the two sons of Eli. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 18. Whenever Samuel went to Eli, and whenever he told Eli what God had prophesied concerning Hophni and Phinehas, how did Eli respond? Did he say, no God, don't do this? Did, did he get down on his knees and petition God that God would change his mind? No, Eli knew that God had made a decree as to what he would do, and Eli submitted to the will of God. 1 Samuel 3.18, Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Dear friends, we're not to be those who try to resist the will of God. We are to be those who submit to it. We sing the hymn, Whate'er be my lot, thou hast caused me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. We're also to surrender to God's will. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. The Christian isn't one who fights against God. The Christian isn't one who wars with God. The Christian isn't one who tries to tell God that they know a better way to do things. The Christian is one who surrenders to the Lord's will. Remember where your peace is found. Your peace is found in salvation, in the sovereignty of God, in submission to God's providence, and in surrender to God's will. Secondly, not only are to we remember where peace is found, we are to resist temptation. Now, we're to resist a number of temptations. First of all, we're to resist the temptation to murmur or complain. Turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 38. Here the disciples bring a terrible accusation against the Lord Jesus Christ. The Savior is in a ship with the disciples, and it says he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? So the ship is going through a storm. The disciples are battling against the storm, and the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting or lying asleep in the ship. And the disciples look at him. They're busy trying to stop the boat from going down, from... Um, from water coming in, from the boat going sideways. And they look at Christ, and he's sound asleep. And they get angry, and they get annoyed. And this builds up as the minutes pass, and maybe as the hours pass. Eventually, they get so annoyed with him that they go and wake him. And they say, Master, why don't you care that we're perishing? Why don't you care that there's a storm? Why don't you care that there's water coming into the boat? Why don't you care that we are going to die? Does Christ care? Yes, he does care about those things. Of course he cares. 
To say that he doesn't care is a false accusation. What did Christ do? He stood up, he rebuked the wind and the waves, and they stopped. But the accusation had been made. Lord, you don't care. How many times have we said in our hearts, Lord, you don't care. You don't care what's happening to me today. You don't care about these problems. Lord, you're not helping me. You're not helping in the way that I want you to help. Dear friend, we're to resist temptation to murmur or complain and say that the Lord doesn't care. As the baby, Moses wasn't aware that he had been put in a, in a basket in the River Nile. He wasn't aware of how he was brought into Pharaoh's house. As he grew up, he could see that he was different. He could see that he was one of the Hebrews. He could see that he wasn't an Egyptian. And as, a, as he was growing up as a teenager, he was maybe thinking, well, why has this happened? But then he learned how Pharaoh had ordered all the babies to be slaughtered and how the Lord had spared his life. He maybe as a young boy didn't understand it, but as he grew up, he came to realize God had a plan for why this happened. And dear friend, you might not know today why you're going through that storm. You might be getting buckets and buckets of water and throwing them out of the ship of your life. And maybe you're saying, Lord, Master, carest thou not that I'm perishing? But he does care. And he has a plan. So we're to resist temptation to murmur or complain. Secondly, we're to resist temptation to take control. How we like to be in control. I don't like... Um, uh, not being in control. I like to be organized. My diary is, is organized uh, several months and uh, e even years in advance. I like to know what's happening uh, where and when. I like to be in control. If we're getting in the car, my wife says, I'll drive. I'll say, oh no, you'll not drive. I'll drive. Well, if we want to get there safely and in one piece, I like to be in control. And, and we like to be in control of our lives. It can be very hard for us to hand the reins over to God, can't it? We don't like to do that. We like to be in control. Turn to John chapter 18, verse 10. The Lord Jesus Christ is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Romans, or the, the servants of the high priests have come. There's soldiers there. Christ is being arrested. And what does Peter do? Peter tries to take control of the situation. They're not going to arrest my Lord. They're not going to arrest my master. John 18, verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. So here we see Peter, ever the bold, ever the brave, he takes out his sword, he's going to fight with them. And there he, cut, he, he attacks the man. He cuts off his ear. It teaches us, first of all, that Peter's a pretty bad shot. He was probably going for his head, but yeah, he got his ear. But there are Peter. He's going to fight. He takes out his sword. He, he takes control of the situation, or so he thinks. But what does the Lord Jesus do? Uh, well, the servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Peter, you think you're taking control of the situation, but you're not. You're going against the will of God. It's the will of the Father that I be arrested. It's the will of the Father that I be put to death. It's the will of the Father that I be made sin for you, Peter. So, Peter, yes, you think you're doing the right thing, but you're not. We're to resist temptation to take control of a circumstance that God is in control of. We're also to resist temptation to be discouraged in our relationship with God. Turn to Psalm 42, verse 11. And how many times has the Christian uttered these words? Why art thou cast down, O of my soul? How often do we feel cast down? How often do we feel discouraged? It maybe happens more than we would like to admit. We're to 
were to resist the temptation to be discouraged. The psalmist says, And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. When things are, are going unexpectedly in our lives, we can, we can be guilty of trying to blame someone. And the person we can try to blame is God. Well, here the psalmist says we're not to do that. We're to hope in God and we're to praise him for he is the health of our countenance. So whenever things are, are not going as expected, whenever you're saying like Jacob, all these things are against me, don't withdraw from God. Draw near to God. James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That's what we are to do. And we're to resist temptation to backslide. Turn to Matthew 14, verse 30. Matthew 14, verse 30. Here's the disciples. They're in a boat again. This time they're in a boat alone. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming to meet them. Not as they expected. He's walking on water. And he's walking out to meet them. And Peter, I admire the faith of Peter. Peter Peter's a wonderful character. Uh, at times he can be impetuous and he can be bold and he can be foolish and he can, he can speak without thinking. But Peter had tremendous faith. The Lord Jesus Christ is walking on water. And what does Peter do? He wants to walk on water too. He wants to walk out in the water to meet him. So in Matthew 14, uh, verse 30, Peter's got out of the boat. He's walking on water to meet the Lord. None of the other disciples said, let us come too. It's only Peter going out to meet the Lord by himself. And as Peter has his eyes fixed upon Christ, he's walking on water. He's, he's living an actual miracle, walking on water. But what happened, verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And dear friends, as soon as Peter took his eyes off Christ, he started to worry. Look at this wind that's blowing around me. Look at these waves that are, are blowing. Look how high they're coming. Look how they're making my feet unstable. As he, as he became concerned of the environment around him, he began to sink. And dear friends, that's what will happen to us. If we take our eyes off Christ, we will struggle. We will backslide. We will grow cold at heart. We will begin to sink. So what did Peter do? He cried saying, Lord, save me. He, he, he went back to Christ. Yes, he had been distracted momentarily by the wind, by the waves. But he came back to Christ, Lord, save me. And the Lord did put out his hand and pulled him up. And dear friend, if we have been distracted by the wind and the waves of life, what are we to do? We're to get back to Christ. Get our eyes fixed upon him again. Cry for his help and his mercy. So we're to resist temptation, to murmur, to take control, to be discouraged in our relationship with God and to backslide. But thirdly and finally here today, we are to resolve to walk with God. David said in Psalm 56 and verse 3, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. We are to trust God at all times. Jacob said, all these things are against me. And the psalmist says, what times I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. Whenever we're afraid, we're not to trust in ourselves. We're not to trust in our fellow men as much as they can be a help to us. We're to trust in God at all times. Although we find ourselves in the midst of that storm, trust in God. Elijah was one of the great characters of the Old Testament, one of the greatest prophets. He trusted God in his confrontation with Ahab. Ahab was the wicked king, and he trusted God. God gave him that holy boldness to stand against wicked Ahab. Elijah battled the prophets of Baal, and he called fire from heaven, and he did it with an unwavering attitude. He did it full of faith. But whenever Jezebel, that wicked woman, threatened him, he fled. He ran away. He traveled a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a juniper tree and he asked God to die. 
because a wicked woman made a threat against him. He had boldness to stand against Ahab. He had boldness to stand against the prophets of Baal. He trusted God in those circumstances, but a wicked woman threatened his life. And he runs away and says, God, take my life. As if God was not able to deal with that wicked woman, Jezebel. As if she was too hard for the Lord to deal with. She wasn't. We're to trust God at all times. We're also to live to glorify God. What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Not my will, but thy will be done. We're to live for his will. Too often we can be consumed with that word, I. I want. I want it this way. Whenever I was a child, my parents hated that phrase, I want. We were never allowed to say that. Even if I said, I want to help you, mommy, you weren't allowed to say, I want. That phrase, I want, was banned. But how often do we approach a day and say, I want this. I want to do that. I want this direction in life. I want that direction in life. I want to see these events happen. I want to see this event happen. How often do we say, Lord, what do you want for me today? What direction do you want to take me, Lord? How often do we have that spirit of Isaiah? Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, use me. Here am I, Lord, direct me. We're to live to glorify God. Daniel could have easily compromised and not prayed to God. Well, it'll be a bit dangerous for me if I pray to God. But instead, Daniel was faithful. As a result, he was cast into the den of lions. But we know what happened there. David, after he brought the goods to his brothers in the army, and he looked at that giant Goliath, he could easily have turned and walked away and said, I'm glad it's not me going out to face him. He could have gone back to his sheep, but he didn't. He said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then he looked at the giant and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should withstand the armies of the living God? Moses could have stayed in the wilderness, feeding sheep. Instead, he surrendered to the will of God to be a leader. Mordecai could have bowed down to Haman for a quiet life, but he didn't. Peter and John could have stopped preaching the gospel for fear of their lives, but they didn't. They counted it a privilege and a blessing to suffer for the Savior's sake. Dear friend, we're not to live for us, we're to live for him. If he gave himself for us, then the least we can do is submit and surrender to his will. So we are to hand the reins over to God. That's what we're to do. If we're to resolve to walk with God this year, we must hand the reins of our life over to him. Psalm 61 verse 2, From the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I lead me. How often do you pray that, Lord, lead me today? Lead me to some dear soul that I may share the gospel with them. Lead me uh, in the workplace that I might work as a faithful and diligent servant. Lead me in my family that I might be that more loving husband, that I might be that more patient wife, that I might be that more able father or mother, that I might be a better child to my mommy and daddy. How often do we pray for the Lord's leading? Psalm 31, verse 3. The psalmist says, For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. As you go through the psalms, you will find this is a, a continual prayer and request of the psalmist. They want the Lord to lead them. They want the Lord to guide them. They don't want to go their own way. They want to go the Lord's way. And every Christian should want to go the Lord's way. Sometimes we create our own problems whenever we sin. Israel, why did they wander the desert for 40 years? Because of their sin, of unbelief. The Lord told them about the promised land. He sent the spies. There were faithful spies, but they wouldn't believe. They didn't trust the Lord. The sin of unbelief brought them 
to wander in the wilderness. David, he committed the sin of numbering the people. God didn't tell him to do that. In fact, he had been told not to do that. As a consequence, pestilence was brought upon the land because of David's sin. Abraham's impatience caused him to take Hagar to be a wife and Ishmael to be born instead of waiting for Isaac. Sometimes we create our own problems and then we blame God. We must confess sin, repent of sin, and ask the Lord to help with the mess that we have made. Well, as we come to a close in this message, in our life we will have many adversities. And these adversities will come in different forms. This year you might face sickness. You might face bereavements. You might face persecution. Your employer might decide they don't like your Christian beliefs and they might move to get you out the door. You might face hostility from those who were perhaps once your friends. They don't like your Christian faith anymore. Dear friend, the issue is not what type of adversity you will face. The question is, how will you respond? Will you respond like Jacob and say, all these things are against me? Or will you respond like Job? Turn to Job 13, verse 15. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. It doesn't matter what God is bringing my way, Job says, even though he's appearing to, to, uh, to bring an end to my life, yet will I trust in him. Turn to Job 19.25. This is where Job's hope and faith and confidence is found. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job says, I can't see what God has planned in my life. I don't know why all, why all these circumstances have befallen me, but I will trust him, and I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and I will stand with him. He looked past his circumstances. He looked past his troubles to his Redeemer. And so are we to do the same. Romans 8, verse 18. The Apostle Paul made this wonderful statement. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us the sufferings of this present time, put them in one side of the scales and put the glory that is to be revealed in us and which will weigh more, the glory. Paul says they're not worthy to be compared. Our sufferings are so minuscule compared to the glory that awaits us in Emmanuel's land. You might say all these things are against me. Psalm 30, verse 5, the psalmist says, For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so it does, dear friend. We pass through valleys, but we go through them. We get out the other side, and we should be coming out the other side with our faith stronger our faith still intact and stronger. I leave you with this verse, Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. Be comforted by this. The eternal God is thy refuge. The eternal God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is thy refuge. He is that place you go to in times of trouble and difficulty. A refuge is a place that you go to when, uh, when times are hard, when you need some place to hide, some place to recuperate, to be refreshed, to be revived. The eternal God is thy refuge. Go to him. And remember this, that underneath you are the everlasting arms. 
the everlasting arms that keep you from falling. Peter says we are kept by the power of God. You cannot see today, dear friend, but underneath you are God's arms keeping you from falling further than your sin would take you. He is keeping you. He is preserving you, faultless, to present you before the throne of His glory. So as you enter this year, don't be tempted to say, all these things are against me. Trust God. He is thy refuge. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank Thee for the comfort of Thy Word, that we can learn from the life of men like Jacob. We can learn from their good qualities, and we can learn from their mistakes. Let us never be tempted to murmur or complain, but let us be those who trust Thee at all times. Lord, as we face adversities in this coming year, be by our side. Preserve us and keep us. In Jesus' name. Amen.